Well, uh, we didn't turn anything on. The it wouldn't be lake fishing if it wouldn't be damselflies. Nope. I just read an article in National Geographic about damselflies, and they're everywhere. They're all over. There's damselflies from the Danube River, actually a red damsel. They're very interesting uh, flies and a big part of our fishing, but it's really the nymphal stage that you're the most successful, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very exciting um, still water hatch to fish. They're a great searching fly as well. They have a one year life cycle, so they're the kind of food, what we call a staple, something they're going to see year round. But when the hatch is on, these nymphs get up within the top foot of the water column and emerge en masse, and trout will follow these emerging nymphs right into the shallows and have some really exciting fishing, including knocking at times when conditions are right, knocking the freshly emerged adults or tenorals right off the the uh, long stem bulrush or cattail, so very exciting. Big, big rises, big, yeah. big exciting takes. Yeah, usually they take you straight into the weeds and snap you off, but it was fun while it lasted. Well, that's that can happen. So this pattern, is it an easy pattern to tie? It's relatively straightforward. We're gonna use aftershaft uh, feathers off the grizzly marabou plume in the thorax, and the whole premise of this fly is mobility. Damsel flies have that sinusoidal, snake-like swimming motion, which can be very tough to duplicate on a straight hook. So this is all about putting some animation and motion in the fly through the bead and the mobile materials to help suggest that moving damselfly nymph. Well, I don't think you can ever have enough good damselfly patterns. So let's take a look at how Phil ties this damselfly pattern. Now going to tie you the grizzly damsel. This is a damsel pattern that uses a lot of mobile materials and a personal favorite of mine, grizzly marabou, to help suggest that unique sinusoidal snake-like swimming motion of the natural damselfly nymphs. I placed a size 10, three extra long curved nymph hook into the jaws of the vise and placed a 764 copper bead up to the front. You can also use gold beads on this fly if you like and you can also tie it with monofilament eyes or bead chain eyes depending on um, the damsels in your and your own tying preferences. I'm going to attach some ADOT tying thread, all of in this case, just directly behind the copper bead, snap away the excess and provide a nice foundation uh, for the materials. Damsel flies are very skinny uh, insects as well, so we don't want to make them too robust and a good uh, barometer is the eyes and head area of a mature damselfly nymph or a damselfly nymph are um, its widest point. So you don't want to make anything wider on the fly uh, or fatter uh, than the head area of the fly, head area of the nymph. So I've got my uh, uh, thread hanging about uh, where the thorax area region will be and for the tail I'm going to tie this in a light olive version. Um, I also tie them in browns, uh, olive, um, and mix and match colors as well. Mix olive and light olive together is another combination. Again, whatever it takes to match the damsels in your local area. So I want to tie in a tail on this fly that protrudes about no more than about half to three quarters of the sh shank length. You can exaggerate the tail a little bit because that helps provide that suggestive swimming motion, and that's what this fly is all about. I'm, I pre-measured the feather. And we'll just take a couple of loose wraps to encompass the feather and then slide my thumb and forefinger back my left hand to keep the materials righted on top of the hook shank. Rather, I'm just lifting ever so slightly on the materials and this helps keep them righted and on top of the, of the hook. And there you have a nice delicate tail. Remember that the, the actual damselfly nymph only has three paddle-like tails that are actually used to draw water uh, sorry, draw oxygen out of the water, so you don't need a lot. And the barring of this marabou, as you can see, just provides a very realistic look. And this fly will flow and breathe in the water. I'm now going to tie in the ribbing material. And for this fly, I'm going to use copper wire to complement the copper uh, bead. And we're just going to tie that in place directly along the near side of the hook forward to the tie-in point. If you've done it right, or close to, you can see I managed to tie in just enough wire so I don't have to trim any off. And we'll just place that into our materials clip. 
for the shell back, I'm going to use some number 12 pearl mylar. And again, the, love to use the, the uh, pearlescent mylars in the still water flies because it adds a little element of flash and attractiveness without being as perhaps as um, overt as, uh, say, silver or gold. Uh, in this case, it may uh, put a fish off because the pearlescent mylar actually mirrors um, the material it's next to. So it'll take on a bit of a, an olive, light olive hue uh, when, you f when this fly is done. It's just a little bit of added attraction without being too, uh, too stark. So that's tied in place directly on top. The flat side of the mylar is right here, and it's flat all the way along the top. I'll place that into the materials clip. Now for the body, I'm going to actually just take some of the plumes off the side of the grizzly marabou, just strip them away, and moisten my fingers, and just spin these right onto the tying thread. And you want to keep this nice and sparse. This um, grizzly marabou dubs just like, is, is, um, just like rabbit. Very easy to work with. Moistening the fingers just helps keep things under control. And keep your, uh, your dubbing uh, noodles nice and short. They're far easier to uh, manage. And it's easier to do the dubbing in small applications rather than trying to guesstimate. You need six inches of dubbing, for example. And you'd be surprised how, mu how far a little bit of dubbing will go, whether it's grizzly marabou like this or another material such as the more popular synthetics nowadays or the natural furs. And we're just going to wind that forward in close touching turns. We want to keep that slender damsel profile in mind. Build up a bit of a taper. And we'll just bind that down. Catch some of that there. We've got a nice slender damsel body and it matches the tail material because it is the tail material. I'm just going to pull our Pearl Mylar over the back of the fly, secure it in place, make sure it's righted on top and again we can center it by just pulling, sort of wiggling it back and forth and supporting it and then folding the Pearl Mylar back out of the way. That wire keeps wanting to jump in to get in the picture so we'll give it its wish. Now I'm just going to take the fine copper wire and counterwind this rib so it stands out a little bit over the top and I actually apply the tension on the downstroke. Again, that way the, the ribs, sorry, the uh, mylar stays in place and the fly, uh, the, sorry, the shell back doesn't roll around to the side of the fly. Let me just bring this all the way up. Again, we'll wind it around the hook shank a few times for added security, tie it off, and using that pulling and twisting motion, break away the excess wire. Sure everything's neat, a nice smooth foundation. For the wing case, we're now going to use um, some Stillwater Solutions Midge Flex. And this is the light olive coloration to sort of complement the overall color of the fly. And we'll bind that in place flat on the hook and back onto the body ever so slightly so that when we finish, our body telescopes naturally into the thorax. There's no um, sort of ditch area that transfers from the body to the thorax because they weren't tied in at the same place. So I always tend to over tie my bodies on my nymphs and then tie the wing cases back onto them. I'm now going to tie in at this point um, the legs which I use the Stillwater Solutions uh, dyed partridge and in this case I'm going to use the olive just to provide a little contrast to the fly. Uh, most things in mother nature aren't all exactly the same color so a little contrast in your flies is always good. And we're going to tie this in place directly behind the bead, wet fly style so that the most prominently marked or con, um, convex side of the feather is facing forward right here. This side is the dull side, the concave side, and this is the convex, or the most prominently marked side. So when I wind this uh, feather forward, when the thorax is completed, the fibers will naturally sweep back along the fly. And tying in the partridge in this manner makes for a really durable tie-in and less risk of the feather actually pulling out, uh, as often is the case if you tried to tie it in there right at the end of the fly 
with a minimum of wraps. It can be quite frustrating. Now, for the thorax itself, I'm going to use the aftershaft feathers um, of a grizzly marabou plume. And you might be saying, well, what's an aftershaft feather? Well, this is a grizzly marabou plume right here. And the aftershaft feather is this little secondary marabou-like feather that probably gets discarded more often than it gets used, but it's, a, it's an excellent material for still water patterns. It has lots of life, uh, comes to, jumps into action whenever it gets wet. It breathes and pulses at the slightest uh, of retrieves. The only drawback to it is it's very delicate. It's very fine stemmed and it's very easy to break if you try and tie it in and palmer it up or wind it forward in a traditional manner. So we're going to use a dubbing loop to help control this material. So the first step here is to remove the plume and what I like to do is I like to trim away the base of the feather where it attached to the stem of the main feather and then I like to make sure that the fibers are relatively even along the side and I just support it right here and I pluck out the narrow pointed tip. So the prepared aftershaft feather looks like this. And as experience has taught me on the size 10, it takes about two of these uh, to do the job. So again, I've got a second feather already selected, trim away the butt and pluck away the tip. And again, the goal is to have a, a nice evenly, uh, even width uh, feather ready to go. Now the trouble is, is we're going to place this into a, a dubbing loop and we've got to use dubbing wax and this is probably one of the few times I actually use dubbing wax and that's to help control this feather. So what we're going to do is just provide a reasonably liberal coating onto about two inches of tying thread here. And you notice the thread is hanging about the midpoint on the thorax because we're going to build up a loop around this um, strand of thread and then secure it back to the wing case tying area and then twist it together and then wind it forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my prepared um, aftershaft feather section and I'm going to lay that right on that uh, tacky thread so that the stem of the feather runs right down um, the thread. It's equally dispersed on either side of the tying thread. And we're going to do that once again, sort of tip to butt lay that in place. And the purpose of the dubbing wax is simply to control that feather. It's very brittle and I just want to hold it there for a second. So I've got those aftershaft feathers lightly tacked in place. I'm going to lay the arms of the uh, dubbing tool onto the tying thread. So I'm just going to bring the tying thread back up to form a dubbing loop and trapping the feathers within the thread strands of that dubbing loop and we wind the thread back closing the loop up tight in the process. Once that's done, advance the tying thread forward to where you've tied in the partridge and allow the bobbin just to hang. And I'm just going to start spinning slowly so the inertia of the twist doesn't throw these fibers out and then once it starts to go like a drill bit and spiral around, I can pick up the pace and spin this until the fibers radiate out about 90 degrees. Still a bit of twist in there, so we can keep going. And there you go. I've taken the, uh, used a dubbing loop here to control a fragile material. Really uh, handy technique to know uh, whenever you're working with uh, less than durable materials and reinforce them. If you tried to, again, if you tried to tie these aftershaft feathers by their tip or their butt and wind them forward, you'd probably be more frustrated at the breakage that occurs. So all we're going to do now is wind this aftershaft doubling loop forward. And again, I'm going to use my left thumb and forefinger to sweep away any fibers. And you're going to create this bushy, scruffy looking, um, feather duster like thorax that, once wet, is just like all marabou, slims down considerably and provides just incredible natural animation to the fly. We tie that off and carefully trim out the excess thread dubbing loop. Now we're going to take our partridge feather and we're going to wind that forward. With the aftershaft thorax now complete, it's time to wind the partridge hackle around to help suggest the legs. Prior to attaching the hackle pliers, I like to grip the partridge and place a half a turn with my thumb and forefinger and attach the 
the hackle pliers to the tip section of the partridge feather on the underside. This helps position the partridge feather to make sure that it's winding perpendicular straight up and down and that the convex or most prominently marked side of the feather is facing forward. So we're just going to wind this around and the partridge hackle will govern the tire so that they can't overwrap the fly. You'll probably get two maybe, maybe three wraps out of the feather. So we'll get a nice sparse set of legs. Remember, damsel nymph only has six. So we'll just trim those away. And now we're just going to part a path for our wing case. Again, we can moisten our fingers to help this process. So we'll sweep these down and back. and secure the partridge in place. When you're selecting your partridge feathers, you want to look for a feather that the tips of the actual fibers of the feather extend about uh, half to three quarters of the shank. That's a good uh, measurement if you've got the right size feather. And we'll just clear that path. Now we're going to pull our wing case material over the top, tie it down, and then we're not ready to trim our wing case yet. We're actually going to take our wing case material and fold it back over the fly and hold it in place. With a couple of loose but firm wraps, we're not super tight because I don't want to flare this up and just get that positioned properly. And then we're going to come in and now we'll trim our wing case. We'll cup the material, kind of grab both ends, support it. I'm not stretching on it, don't do this, just support it. You can see that there's no tension, I'm just basically gathering material and I come in about half the shank length on about a 30 degree angle with my scissors. I make one cut and I create a nice little notched wing case. This helps suggest the natural nymphs. And if you like, if you don't like the thread uh, wrapped up in there that you can see your, your handiwork, uh, a lot of tires will simply take a little bit of the, ostr so you're the uh, grizzly marabou. You see I've got about 3 eighths of an inch just lightly spun onto the tying thread. We can wrap that right in place behind the eye. And we can take a little bit of our brushable glue, fisherman's glue here, coat about 3 eighths of an inch. Let that work its way in so I don't run the risk of matting all those soft mobile fibers down or accidentally gluing them in the wrong place. And then a few well-placed turns of whip finish directly behind the bead and your grizzly damsel is complete. This is an excellent pat pattern to both search um, the shoreline areas of the lake where damsels like to inhabit, especially long uh, flowing aquatic vegetation. Uh, fish this fly on an open loop knot so you can really get the ad added swagger and motion of the fly. And when this fly is wet, all of these components along with the weighted head serve to pitch and move this fly through the water and suggest that sinusoidal or snake-like swimming motion of the natural damsel. Tie it in olive, light olive, um, browns, um, tans as well. Uh, lots of different color combinations out there that can be tried. It's a great still water pattern. I've just noticed some fish working on uh, just below the surface. Uh, you think the damsels are, don't they swim in to shore? Yes, they do, Jack. We're perfectly positioned here. We're right up tight to the bank, and, and damsel flies swim toward shore just beneath the surface. Uh, a lot of times when the hatch is strong, on mass, and they'll swim right towards the shoreline where they'll emerge on the long stem vole rush or cattails or the rocks themselves or the sides of the boat in this case. So we're perfectly positioned here because we're retrieving our flies in the same uh, direction that the, the migrating nymphs will. Now I know you're using a uh, uh, intermediate uh, slow sinking line. Now, I've got uh, a couple, uh, I've got your grizzly damsel, mm -hmm. and then I've got a uh, coronamid, kind of giving them two different flies. I'm just letting it drift, yep. and they rest, don't they, when they're... Yeah, they swim with a, um, I guess the proper scientific term is a sinusoidal, more like a snake-like swimming motion, so a lot of energy is expended but they don't seem to make much forward progress. They're getting there, but not at any great world record pace. So there's lots of rests. So by hanging that fly like you've got under an indicator mm -hmm. and giving it a strip, that, that grizzly damsel, all those materials will come alive and look like the wiggling nymph. And then as you stop, they'll settle back down. And as that nymph settles, it, it'll uh, imitate a, a resting nymph. There's a fish right there. Yep. 
Looks like you took a nymph right underneath the surface. Right underneath the surface. The damsels are coming in. Now, do you readjust by stripping a little faster? Well, I'm trying to, I just thought I'd pick it up and maybe I can attract him. He looked like he was heading back down and, and uh, may not actually see the fly. So I'm just trying to pull it through and draw attention to it and see if uh, he'll come up and have a look. But he doesn't appear to want to do that. I'm going to take and do one of those 12 inch strips with that. Yeah. Let's see if you can draw them that way. Exciting to see fish moving on a lake. I, I think that's uh, one of the things a lot of anglers miss when they say, ah, I don't want to go to the lake because it's always stripping flies in. And when they're close to the surface, it's going to be, it's like fishing a spring creek. Yeah, it's very exciting. Well, there All you right. go, Jack. Proof in the pudding. Well, it's about time to get my fly out of the way. This looks pretty neat. Yeah, he's nice and silver bright and he's yep. somewhat upset with what's going on right now. So yeah, this is what I like about being up in Canada here with the, the Kamloops rainbow. I'm just going to get this fly line off the ground so I don't do something silly like... Step on it? Step on it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now he's running towards me. No, now he's going out to sea. Whoa! Whoa. Well, you know, I could actually do something productive, like net the fish for you. <laughs> well, I'm really glad that when we were at, together at the show, the fly fishing show in Calgary, and you invited me up here to Alberta and to this great lakes that you've got here. Look how fat yeah, that there. fish is. Holy nice. cow. <laughs> That's a nice fish. Well, let's get That's that. what you call a football <laughs> fish. It's amazing, even with the barbless fly, how they can get in oh, that yeah, mandible. Oh, he's just whacked it, and he's just... Here. There we go. Got it? Yeah, I'm just going to turn the fly around. There we go. Out she comes. You know, that's a, that's a good uh, average size lake fish, isn't it? Yeah, I'll take a uh, hundred of those. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind you're going to expect to catch on a lake. Yeah. There he goes. He's well rested.